Okay, up to date. Um, recall that I'm trying to compare these three kinds of categories of health policy on these three particular um, dimensions, equity, efficiency, and administrative feasibility. We were just about, we were just starting primary health care. Um, and uh, I wanted to remind you that um, we can't, it's really hard to find in any nationally representative data in India, any effect, quite frankly, of uh, presence of public facilities influencing child health. Um, one, pos one point is that public facilities are quite a small fraction of the entire story. It, healthcare in India is basically private. If we had the equivalent of one box on the population-based public health that you know that I'm biased towards, um, then there would be three on preventive health care. Public curative care in PHCs would be about 20 boxes. In hospitals, somewhat more. And in private care, the area of the box is one unit of spending. Unit of spending. Right, 80%. <laughs> <laughs> 75 boxes. <laughs> um, that is, uh, the, a private care is, uh, is uh, about, um, well, certainly at primary level, about 80%. Uh, and, and the private, what is this private sector anyway? It can't really compete in the market for expensive procedures. There's no insurance, really. RSBY will come back to, except in a niche market in urban areas. This is changing, or at least I'm told it's changing, but the data on all of this is both sparse and late, uh, meaning I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> um, but okay, that's a, a story in transition. But the private sector is also a broad range of services. There are real doctors, that means MBBS or MD or something like that. Uh, people who have been to medical school, um, traditional medical system practitioners and totally untrained quacks. Uh, all, from, all of these are for minor illnesses. When it's serious, people go to or get referred to hospitals, or I suppose they die if it's a serious, enough, uh, serious and uh, urgent enough case. So public primary care is really just one option in a much larger private market. Let's take a look at one of those. This is a, a village of two hamlets in eastern Madhya Pradesh. Um, you can see there's the larger, better served uh, hamlet at, at the top, which has two public providers and one private MBBS doctor. It's very possible that that private MBBS doctor is assigned to one of the public facilities and is moonlighting, we don't know. Um, then, the, But there is this um, uh, little hamlet to the south, which has a bunch of households, and you might say they are underserved. Certainly, if we were to count doctors per capita or something like that, you might think they were underserved. There's this one guy over there on the on the left. Um, he isn't really an outcast. He's just sort of a grumpy guy. Um, any case, uh, but these, this is uh, this village is not in isolation. There's a larger village two miles away. That's uh, three three and a half kilometers. Where uh, that most people go to when they're sick, um, and um, you might notice. So this is a satellite image. Do you see anything particular that might connect the village we're interested in and the village that's larger? See, there's that really straight line going down that sort of goes to that underserved village. That's called a road. And it's not that difficult to, um, uh, to get to the village. In that village, there's one public, that's the blue tack somewhere, um, and 11 private real doctors, meaning MBBS. But there's also eight homeopaths, 15 Ayurvedas, a bunch of Unani. Anybody know what an electro-homeopath is? This, this is self-described uh, uh, by electro-homeopath. I have no idea what that is, but he called himself that, so I, I include it. Integrated medics, pharmacists, 
and a whole bunch of people who have no training whatsoever that those are the white um, uh, thumbtacks. So, uh, so there's so many people in this village and, and the neighboring village that there's excess capacity. It's a village. You mean, you yeah, think I just village. drew that? That big village is yeah. a village? Big village is Big village, hamlet, and sub hamlet. Um, there's so much stuff going on. The market is so big. There's so many competitors that um, there's actually a lot of excess capacity in the public facilities. Um, so public employees in the sample of rural Madhya Pradesh, rural Madhya Pradesh, work 39 minutes a day. Um, that's the same as for private providers who also work approximately 39 minutes. Uh, oh uh, no! They go to lot. They go to lots of other play people. <laughs> well, utilization is so low. Capacity utilization is so low. So I have ten factories. They're only working two hours a day. Uh, so what the, the bars are uh, an example that the fifth and the ninety fifth um, uh, percentile of busyness <laughs> for public and um, private facilities. A public not particularly busy employee, uh, uh, doctor is working from 10, 15 to 10, third, 20 <laughs> or so. Uh, a, a, a very busy public facility is working for a full two hours. Remember, they're open from eight to, to three. Is that correct? Um, the private less busy is, has people going to them. And the private very busy is, is busy for couple hours uh, of the day. Now you might think, yeah, so, okay, so there's excess capacity for private too. Isn't that a, that's a problem? I'm not sure. I mean, the private doctor um, only gets paid when he's working. That's how you get paid. That's what, that's what business is. Um, and therefore, it's not really costing us anything. It's costing the patient um, uh, the money that uh, just for the time that the doctor is working. But for the public doctor, are we paying him uh, for 39 minutes a day? No, of course not. They have, a, they have uh, their pay set as if they were working seven hours a day. Um, we get similar results, sorry, not we, colleagues of, uh, of mine and of Jishnu Das, who, who is the source of a lot of the uh, data that isn't mine and uh, some work that we do together, some that, that he does by himself, some of the work will be from me alone. Uh, but we work, but a lot of that is from Jishnu Das. A colleague of ours, Ken Leonard, University of Maryland, uh, does similar things in Africa, Tanzania and Senegal, where everybody complains of a doctor shortage that is at least as bad as in uh, India. They also work about 39 minutes a day. In fact, it's a bizarre, it's, it's bizarrely close to 39 minutes uh, a day. So we have to think about what's, the, what's this market? What market are we actually trying to intervene in? What's the nature of, what's the nature of equilibrium? So, blah, blah, blah. Um, what, one of the things we'd like, might like to know is the size of the cross-price elasticity. Cross-price cross elasticity meaning, well, actually it's not necessarily price in this case. It's really how substitutable are, is the private sector and the public sector. So it's not really a, necessarily a price elasticity. It's kind of, maybe it's a cross, I don't think we have a word for this, cross distance elasticity. In any case, it's the change in demand for one of the, of the providers with respect to the proximity of the other. So that if you put in a new public facility, it's kind of the change in demand for the private doctors who are already there. Um, uh, but we might also uh, worry about if for some reason the private doctors change their prices, how much can they expect to draw from the public sector um, uh, in, in each of these markets? This turns out to be a fairly important question. Um, of course, and it, that's not entirely captured by the, just the fact that there's a lot of public, of private providers. We don't, you can't infer the substitutability just from the size, but we do know that people do switch back and forth quite uh, a bit. Um, it's very difficult to, uh, to measure what cross-price elasticities in practically any demand system, and this one is no exception. Um, the other thing we might like to worry about is the difference in the quality of care 
between the types of providers. Um, the, and we'll get to that in, uh, in a while. The answer might surprise you. In any case, what we really want to know, if we're trying to think about expanding the public sector, is we'd like to know what the net effect, that's net of any activity in the private sector, um, of expanding services. If the government is just a small part of the market, um, then they're not really, when we talk, I think universal health care is a little bit ambitious because that, does that really mean that it's going to increase by a factor of five if it's only 20% of the, uh, the market? And so what we're really talking about, forget universality for the second, for, for the time being, let's just talk about what happens if we increase it somewhat. What is the net effect uh, on the entire market of services? So I totally get that if hypothetically we switch from 5% public to 10% public and private production goes down from 95 to 90, we haven't achieved a whole lot. Okay. You may be on management questions about the efficiency of resource use in public sector versus efficiency of resource use in the private sector. You mean something, so, like, you mean something like that? <laughs> but finish your... Now, suppose I came at this from a completely different point of view, that there is a market failure in terms of tremendous asymmetric information. The doctor is God as far as the patient is concerned. Doctors misbehave with patients. They prescribe procedures and uh, drugs that are entirely inappropriate in their quest for profit maximization. And that a public facility would be relatively less prone to those kinds of behaviors. Um, okay. So if I believed that in and of itself the profit maximizing private doctor is going to push inappropriate drugs and procedures down to hapless patients and that public providers are less inclined to do so, then expansion of the public sector is good in and of itself because it leads to consumer protection. Oh, one second. Just, you know, adding to that, whenever we say the net effect, I don't understand how do we measure net effect. Health. In health, the, of, health of people. Yeah. I mean, no, which is why, which is why the quality is yeah, is very. Such you know, it, it depends on at what stage of your health crisis are you approaching the doctor, right? So if you're approaching when you have a mild fever, again that can be good and bad. Or you wait, wait it out till you must approach the doctor, and that can be good or bad. Again, so I, I you know, how do you think about this? Um, for, for the time being, let's see what the value of a visit to a doctor. Whatever you think the value of a visit to a doctor is, is the effect that we're looking at. Because then imputing the health effect is, is complicated. I will get, get, grant you that. But it must be the case that a visit to the doctor is expected to result in something. Uh, what we're trying to think of is if we're trying to expand the public sector in the middle of a private sector, we have to worry about this substitution, substitution both the size of the substitution and the relative effectiveness of the um, of the two two sectors, and I completely agree, though, uh, uh, with the point that if you think there's a market failure because the government, the private sector is exploiting people, that's a very very interesting a priori theoretical statement. Maybe we should look at the real world and see whether or not that's actually true, and I will come back to that in a few slides. Um, in any case. I still think we're tr we should be thinking of this as an ordinary economist. What's the marginal effect of trying to inc of increase a service? And here's a little picture of, in fact, if this is uh, the horizontal arrow is trying to expand supply by a public by putting a public facility, you could have a lot of effect. Um, I, I labeled this poor area. It, I don't really know whether it's rich or actually this came from an example of the Philippines they actually were a poor area um, if the supply elasticity is very low in the private sector you might get a, you might uh, get a fair amount of this because there'd be very little crowding out if the supply elasticity of the private sector is very high controlling for quality which we'll come back to um, it's possible that you'll be crowding out a lot of people and the net impact on visits to doctors and whatever that's worth um, uh, might be quite small. However, in working in uh, economic health in the last 20-something years, 30-something years, um, 
the price elasticity of the supply of private medical services has never been mentioned to me by anyone except me. Um, and so here you see that it might be, or an argument could be made, that it is a critical piece of information. It is one that is almost entirely unstudied. So the question is, do poor people, I'm going to bring in a little bit of equity, I'll come back to it though, rely on the, on the public sector? Well, this is based on, for primary care, um, this is based on the uh, um, NSS uh, 1995 round. We'll talk about why is the data so old. Uh, but notice that um, this 80% uh, that go to the uh, private sector, it doesn't seem to be particularly related to people's income. The average over the all of India, it's, it looks to me as like completely flat, that everybody goes to the um, private sector about 80% of the time. Um, so it's not like the private sector is serving the poor and the public sector is serving the rich. Everybody's going to the private sector. Um, in hospitals, uh, it's, uh, it, the gradient is different. Richer people, in fact, do visit private hospitals more than um, whatever else they would have in mind. Um, uh, but that doesn't appear to be true in uh, primary care. There's some interesting stuff. We're going to jump over this quickly. There's some interesting... Inter how do you define primary care? Uh, I define it as cheap. Uh, in the NSS, it's uh, um, uh, anything except the hospital. So paramilitary health care is, by definition, yeah. produced at primary care? Yes, that's right. Anything with inpatients is, is hospital. Anything with, without inpatient is, is primary. Um, this is from the 1995 uh, NSS. Uh, you might wonder, why do I have to go back this far to... Um, to get data, and in fact, it is something of a scandal that I have to go back this far to get uh, data. The 2005 NSS, which also had the health module, did not actually ask for income in the same way that um, uh, the rest of the NSS does. It, uh, usually, they use, I don't know if you're familiar, there's the thin round and the thick round of, of consumption uh, data. 1995 had a full thin round of consumption data. In 19, 2005, they asked something like, what's your income? which of course in an agricultural society means, I don't know what that means. So it actually can't be done for the 2005. I'm hoping that that was corrected for the one that is coming out now. I have not yet seen the, um, um, the data that in fact, I hope that they have real consumption data um, in this round. Uh, so generally you might doubt the effectiveness of, pu of a public. Yeah, oh, sorry, that's what I was going to... If we had time to go through this, some of these interstate variations are quite interesting. Uh, one that I... Th this we is what... All month. Yeah, what? We, we, we have all month. month. We want to hear all your stories. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we only have three more sessions, including this one. Yesterday, when we were talking about... What's interesting is that there was a dirty area. I mean, we were talking about the London map. Within it, you found a clean area because you had the radiations being done. So, in the primary healthcare sector as well, do you sort of see uh, pockets where the primary healthcare sector actually works? Oh, in, sure. In a, in a large mass where it doesn't, it can be studied. Can we get some distance uh, elasticity? Not, not with the not with uh, data that already exists. That would be really hard to do with data. However, very interesting question. Very important uh, kind of concept to explore, and therefore um, a, a good design for for future for future work. It's not there in primary, but it is there in inpatient. The gradient meaning the, the, no, the uh, interstate variation. So West Bengal. Uh, well, no, no. There's there's inter, there's interstate variation. Look at Rajasthan as far as private sector. That's really weird. Like right? richer that's, people, that's rich. rich people use the private sector less in Rajasthan than. Uh, than so interesting. You have contacts, no, with the doctors. So that's okay. But then now uh, with hospitals, it's upset. With hospitals, yeah. So mm -hmm. what is uh, hospitals West Bengal versus? Canada? So actually. Uh, I wanted to point to, uh, Carol is actually the story that most people say, rich people use the private sector more 
and that appears to be true in both um, uh, primary care and hospital care. But you know, look, it, it, it's 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 still uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, people in poor, in poor parts of Kerala that also use the private sector. So it, we, I think, we expect these bars to be going up. Um, what's interesting to me is this is West Bengal in 1995. So what kind of government was that? It was the, the so this is quite interesting that this is during a, uh, the communist and policy. this question is not in NFHS. No, this question is, is not. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, NFHS is doing such a great job of so many other things. Yeah, but mm. let's stick to this. So okay. what are the stories behind the... So, so I think it's interesting. I'm going to come to uh, general orientation that the West Bengal um, uh, allocation looks pretty good to me. Uh, that so interestingly, that it wasn't a communist uh, uh, government that was actually pushing for everybody getting care at primary centers, because in fact, the West Bengal levels are slightly higher. Well, how much higher than eighty percent can you be? But uh, slightly higher uh, use of primary of private sector in primary care. That might be where all the Bengali doctors in the rest of the country are are coming from. Um, uh, but if you look to at what happens to hospital care in West Bengal, there the government is taking uh, taking its role seriously, which is more or less in line with the private sector might be able to do something in primary care and absolutely can't do anything in uh, hospital care and the West Bengal. So you're suggesting that the CPM government actually got that right absolutely. in terms of you know, let the primary be done by whoever is doing it, and there are enough people doing it, and uh, uh, the hospitals are the primary. Those who are in the of, of consumption per capita as measured by the NSS consumption module. Uh, do we have stuff on the public hospitals then? In well, so there's some, some related paper or something, so that relates to. Well, it's 100 uh, minus. explains the patterns. Uh, no, I don't have that. That would be uh, worth doing. No idea. It's really interesting that it seems to be the richer people who are capturing the um, benefits of public um, services in, in primary care in Rajasthan. I have no idea what that was all about. Uh, but I do want to say that just looking at the real world for a little bit should cure us from thinking that, oh, yeah, 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 the public sector is actually taking care of the poor um, and um, as opposed, and the private sector is only for rich people. Um, well, another, this part of that large market, I'm going to skip over this. I did some work recently in Pakistan. Um, it turns out that uh, very few people go to the public sector there either. Primary or uh, uh, primary is, is what I was looking. So this is for treatment of diarrhea and cough and fever, and it actually looks like um, the, the um, uh, sec Pakistani health sector is becoming more private. Uh, the public sector is not actually keeping up with um, uh, demand. Uh, but the, the lots of detail here that we don't have to go into. But in India, what's happening over time? I don't know. People say the NRHM has changed all this. I've given some version of some of this, obviously this is very old data. I've given some version of, the, of that part of the talk for some time now and everybody says, oh, oh it's way out of date. Uh, NRHM came in, your data is really old. Yeah, the data is really old. I didn't have, I mean, nobody collected it ever. Uh, uh, and NRHM changed the entire story. I'm perfectly happy to believe that, however, um, the preliminary NSS for uh, 2015 seems to say the private sector is still 80% of primary care visits. I believe in the conference last month, Abhijit Banerjee, I don't know where he, whether, how he saw this, but he said it's the same number that it's always been. It's been, it's 80%. Some studies on impact of before after in small areas. In small areas. Um, but we don't, it's a gigantic program. Perhaps we should have some sense of what happens nationally. Okay. Um, open question. Um, everybody says everything's changed. The first set of data that seems to coming out, it does not so clear. Are you implying that the 
mind that we do a post hoc evaluation of NRHS. <laughs> but the thing is, not, we did not measure this is the baseline. Let's not. Yeah, but we didn't measure the baseline. Let's so, not. Uh, we have to edit all this out. So let's okay. not. <laughs> uh, now I've lost track. Of, let's see what the next slide is. Be surprised. Ah. So. Oh. oh. Quick clarification. Does uh, delivering child does it come under primary care? No, right? no, actually, and that I have heard has increased that there's a lot more institutional deliver deliveries. Interestingly, there's not a lot of data, or as far as I, I have not seen anything on whether that's actually improved infant mortality or, or maternal mortality. No, uh, no, my question is does it okay. fall under the category of primary care? Is it primary? Is it hospital? Uh, secondary or is it primary? In, in this data? Yeah. Because uh, the context of my question is I remember reading uh, Jishnu Das paper blog post where he says that uh, government doctors here are overloaded with work because they tend to deliver 50, 60 mothers and mothers a day. Uh, actually, that's work that was. That it's not a lot. Yes, but th th that's generally um, at larger facilities. Uh, that is work that we're doing um, now to see whether, in fact, there's the overload of, of government doctor time. Um, there's also another whole range of issues r related to um, uh, iatrogenic infections that are c contracted in the facilities uh, with such crowding going on in, in maternity wards. People don't know anything about that. Uh, all kinds of things could be going on. In this data, I would I I don't want to I I don't want to say exactly because I don't know where that was classified off the top of my head. Uh, a lot of this emphasis on primary health care has was generated from uh, 1977 at the Alma Ata uh, uh, conference in well uh, in, in what in what's now Kazakhstan, um, where um, the entire international community said that it was very important to do primary care. And a lot, one of the reasons why um, this was, um, uh, one of the impetuses for this uh, consensus in the international community was the experience of China with the barefoot doctors. So, uh, and that everyone thought we should imitate what China did um, because the, everybody should have access to a doctors. So let me ask you a question, what about China? Didn't those barefoot doctors work? And isn't, wasn't that a good thing for the, for the world to take this lesson and try to generalize it? Well, here's a graph of infant mortality in China taken from Bill Shao's paper of 1984 with one fact that he didn't actually tell anybody about. Um, this, so the, this uh, China, data in China, we can debate whether what it's worth altogether. However, this is the, this is the official um, data. In, 19, in 1949, they estimate, obviously it's an estimate since it goes since uh, forever before that, of 20% uh, uh, infant mortality, that's 200 per thousand. Um, and that there was a precipitous drop in infant mortality all the way to 1963. And we are told that this might be due to the barefoot doctors. But the barefoot doctors were first announced in October 1965 in a speech that Mao uh, Zedong uh, gave in Chongqing. And it's very difficult, unless something's moving at faster than the speed of light, uh, <laughs> to see how those barefoot doctors led to that fall in infant mortality. What did lead to the fall, what, what the best hypothesis I can think of uh, that led to the fall in infant mortality in China between 1949 and 1963, uh, with a big blip that's not there because of the Great Famine, I'm not sure where this data uh, came from, uh, was an enormous effort on the traditional public health interventions. Much greater penetration of safe water throughout the countryside and the cities, much emphasis, a uh, great deal of emphasis on um, sanitation throughout uh, the country, including rural areas. And then there was the five pest campaign. I don't know whether you know it. Uh, the five pests were uh, snails, black flies, rats, mosquitoes, 
and birds. Birds were for agricultural purposes, but the other four were, uh, were uh, explicitly for disease control. Uh, Mao had something about helminth infections, uh, schistosomiasis, which is why snails was one of those. Um, but with these gigantic public good interventions, I think that was what really happened in China between 1949 and 1963. That could be completely wrong. However, I know that it can't be because of the barefoot doctors, because it all happened before they were even announced. 22 is a very good number for early 60s. Actually, it's a, 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 a remarkably uh, good number uh, for, uh, for, for the early uh, for the early days. Uh, when, in fact, some people forget how much progress we've made in the world just since I've been, when I was in graduate school, infant mortality in some very poor countries, I'm not quite sure India fit at that time, uh, was as high as 50%. Um, 50%. Many of African countries, or at least the data presented, was, uh, was close to 50%. We don't see anything like that. Even in, even in refugee camps, we don't see anything like that. Um, and, uh, even, and also in countries that have no functioning government, uh, let alone a functioning health system, because we have a similar kind of reduction in infant mortality, even in countries like Guinea which nobody would ever accuse as having a, a functional health system. Um, <laughs> um, we can speculate as to what actually happened. I have a few opinions. I think the invention of antibiotics in 1949 was a really good thing. And when, the, and when people started buying and selling antibiotics, that helped grow a great deal, just like the, the, the hypothesis before. Diffused all, over the world. Diffused all over the world. Might have taken a little while to to, to get there, but it got there. Um, and then, of course, there are um, more medicine, second round of antibiotics. Um, chloroquine came into um, effect about the same time. Lots of drugs came in. And all of our, all of our modern immunizations um, came in um, uh, during this period. And so we should, in fact, look at history a little bit and say, you know, things are really much better now than they, uh, they used to be. However, Antibiotics finding their way into the rural areas the same way that Thumbs Up or Coca-Cola could find its way into the rural areas. It could just be diffusion of, um, of, uh, of modern drugs uh, through private training. Okay, now I forgot what's going on. Oh, okay. Maybe you say, Jeff, this whole thing about efficiency, that's, beyond, that's besides the point. That's not why we do primary health care in the first place. The whole point of this is to help poor people not to actually expect that it has anything to do with health. I don't really think so, but. Sorry, one more reason why we want to do primary care is that it avoids people getting into hospitals. Yes, okay, so uh, we'll have to come back to that several times. Um, but the, maybe the point is to have more equitable, equitable distribution of public expenditures. Maybe, sometimes yes. Sometimes no. Maybe we should look at the real world before we start making conclusions about this. So here's the distribution of, of subsidies for curative care uh, in India from, uh, based on the same 1995 um, study. Hospitals are certainly not a good um, way of distributing um, uh, health care, at least across income groups. That's currently the case. PHCs, mm, ambiguous. Uh, in the world as a whole, now this diagram could take up a whole session. This is a paper um, that's much referenced uh, that says it's very important to have free care because it keeps people from falling into poverty. I don't know whether so what, what this diagram says, it's really a cumulative distribution function of income with the axes reversed. It should be an S-shaped curve instead of this thing, but I think uh, they, they wanted to show dropping into poverty. Um, the orange curve, if you can see what that is, it's sort of the smooth, the smooth curve on the top of the red lines, is the pre-health payment consumption, a uh, distribution of consumption. And so if you flip the axes, you see that it's an ordinary S-shaped distri cumulative distribution function. What they did was they took out the um, 
health expenditures, which are, re re are reflected in the red lines. And then they saw that some people dropped below an arbitrary um, uh, poverty line. And therefore they said, income dis uh, this service should be free because it will prevent poor people from dropping into poverty. I don't see that. <laughs> if the thing that I see, I look at this and I fuzz up my eyes and I say, all of the expenditures happening on the right side of the distribution. I don't know, which means that the that it's relatively wealthy people who are spending money on health care and not poor people who are spending money on health care. Uh, in fact, our ordinary uh, measure of what distributional impacts of anything work, this, whether what this commodity uh, is, is a relative, has a very high income elasticity. It's relatively wealthy people who spend on this service, not relatively poor people. If we were to think of what would something that really helps poor people look like, it would be food. Let's think of what this would look like if we looked at take out food from people's consumption bundles and see what happens to uh, post food con expenditure. Everybody on the left hand side, poor people spend eight, 60, 70, perhaps 80% of their income on food. Everybody on the left hand side of that uh, diagram would dr drop to absolute destitution levels. And, every, and the uh, difference between that post uh, food line and the pre-food line would start to actually converge on the at the rich at the on the right side of the um, of the of the diagram. If we really wanted to find a commodity with a low income elasticity, it would be food. This is a diagram, as far as I can tell, of a commodity with a very high income elasticity. And in fact, whenever this is estimated, it's almost always 1.5. I'm not. It's, it's just a coincidence, probably, that it comes out that way. What I find very interesting is that this diagram is used to show that health expenditure, free health care, helps the poor, and I just don't see it. Is this a hospital just Yes. So it's not like primary care. Because primary care, you might see that it's... It's everything. So, but even if it were mostly primary care, on the left side, there just aren't that many people who are near where the poverty line hits the distribution of income who are spending very much money on, um, on, uh, on health. And in any case, an arbitrary poverty line, this would get us into those fights a few years ago. You remember whether you could get, well, whenever the poverty line gets announced, there's always fights about its exact location. You get these. I mean, but that's correct however there's no place in this diagram that uh, that health expenditures are actually hurting uh, are actually dropping people on the left hand side and not the right hand side that's because they're Okay. Let me ask you a question. If this was Rolls Royces, what would it, what would be the difference? It would look just like that. Automobiles, color televisions. So maybe maybe people maybe poor people just can't buy color televisions. So the question is, how much do you trust people? to um, spend money in their own best interest. If you trust them to spend money in their own best interest, this is an indication that, um, th that uh, all of the benefit to a subsidy to this would go to rich people. I think if the avenue is food versus health, and food is definitely higher on your hierarchy of needs. But I think it's a little, I'm more convinced that we can take this to argue that health is a luxury good. Uh, I, I think we can. I think we can say that the definition of a luxury good is every good that has an income elasticity greater than one, and this has one that's, that's very much higher than one. That is the definition of a luxury good. Look at angle curves. This is shouting that the angle curve is going out as you get richer. What I'm wondering is if it's for primary care, how is it? It is. No. It, uh, actually, uh, uh, 
I won't I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, every time I've seen it for primary care, it's the same. Dot, um, rich people. In fact, I know it's the same. Um, morbidity in rich countries is, is, is higher than morbidity in poor countries. Uh, morbidity in the United States is higher than mor measured morbidity in India. That can't possibly be true. Um, but it, but it, and it's also the case in all of, um, even if it isn't spending, it's uh, answers to the question, were you sick in the last blank days, goes up with income. Now, of course, that can't really be true. Um, but a lot, but even for minor illnesses, relatively rich people probably have no tolerance for discomfort. And so, and all of those things are primary care. Every survey I've ever seen has the, the higher the income, the more frequently you but see. That's an I don't know. It's interesting that had I done, I like to to examine our own uh, assumptions. This happens when I present this to my students in, uh, in New Jersey, uh, is if I had said that this was color televisions, everyone would say, oh yeah, sure, fine. <laughs> but because it happens, we, because we don't like the conclusion on this one, we attack the uh, uh, assumptions. Uh, if I said this was actually Rolls Royces or color televisions or jewelry or something, which would look exactly like this, um, we would say, oh yeah, sure, why not? High income elasticity, it's obvious. We start mentioning this on something that happens to hit our heartstrings, and for some reason we think something else is going on. Just, just important to uh, keep in mind our own judgments on this. Which, going back to my to the previous uh, point, which is we see that um, there's free care in public facilities in that in the village that had all of these different kinds of doctors. Um, uh, around. Obviously, the private sector is not giving free care. Otherwise, well, obviously, the private sector is not giving free care. Yet we see that 80% of, um, of Indians are going to the private sector instead of um, uh, going to have publicly provided care at zero price. Which leads to the question, <laughs> Why can't we even give this stuff away? Or, you know, I spent most of my career in the World Bank. I wouldn't have phrased it uh, that way in any report that I wrote for the World Bank. I would probably have come up with something like uh, implementation poses challenges. <laughs> so let's take a look <laughs> at, um, uh, at, at that. Let's take, ask a different question, slightly, pretty much the same. Primary health care centers. What do people find when they get there? Well, the first thing they find when they get there is nobody's there. <laughs> um, so we have lots of uh, vacancies. I try, this, this is all the state, well, a bunch of all the major states organized more or less from poor to rich, from left to right, Bihar on the left, and was it Punjab on the right? I don't know whether you think that's going down or not. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me. You can see that uh, lots of states have a hard time um, um, filling their uh, vacancies um, up to 25, 30%. Uh, for the very poor uh, um, states. Punjab seems to have a problem. Punjab and Haryana also seem to have a problem. I don't know what that's all about. Uh, but in any case, um, it's very difficult to fill a lot of the vacancies in primary health care. Think about it. Who's a doctor? You had to have gone to college. What fraction of the po Indian population has gone to college? I don't know. Small. <laughs> But it's not just going to college. You had to have scored really, really high on your 12th standard exams to be able to study medicine, right? So we're talking about some, uh, as, as in the current United States, the 10% or the 1% of the... <laughs> uh, uh, so we're talking about the uh, elites. They are almost certainly born and bred in urban areas way disproportionately, even if it's not a universal uh, truth. And the kinds of jobs we're offering are in the middle of rural areas. They're not the most attractive jobs. People don't really want to, to, to work there, especially people with college degrees and so on, so possibly families. Good, excellent point. <laughs> Keep these things in mind, which is, in fact, that's exactly part of the, the, the reasoning here is, it, why did we think they were going to go there, in which case, don't, shouldn't we have anticipated an implementation problem? Uh, and so when we're balancing equity and efficiency and 
capability of government to do it, maybe we should ask some questions about do we really think these people are going to go into rural areas. I, I think that's exactly the, the point. Uh, in the earlier village map that we saw, who were the 11 MBBS doctors? Yeah. Uh, in that particular village, I couldn't tell you. In, in lots of cases, they are uh, public, another interesting point, they are sometimes public doctors in their private practice. That's certainly a very common thing. And in fact, sometime we might discuss a another kind of research project, which is perhaps the, uh, the salary of a doctor, of a public doctor, can be considered a relocation grant to send a private doctor into uh, rural areas, which from the you know, following the rules point of view is a very bad thing, but from an economist point of view, maybe that's okay. <laughs> maybe that's what, that really is the benefit of the public system is to make sure that there are private doctors in <laughs> rural areas rather than public doctors. But that was a, that's a good point. I don't, I'm making that up. I don't really know if that's the, the case, but it's certainly something that should be uh, examined. In any case, one of the problems is vacancies. This, this is not just India. Everybody has this problem. And I'm not sure why the Amahada Convention thought that they could change human nature. Um, but this is, um, these are the, all the provinces of Indonesia, um, and it goes from absolutely zero, the, the one all the way on the left, uh, sorry, the, the columns are the names of, of provinces of Indonesia, and since they don't mean anything to any of us, I didn't bother <laughs> to write them down. It's not just to do about where they study, but because there are schools there. So they worry more about where will their children Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's right. So, they, you know, they, they don't want to move there. They don't want to have their children there. They serve, they're normal people. They want their children to have at least as good as life as, as good a life as they had, and they're not going to sacrifice their children. A lot of them coming from maybe rural areas, but they don't want their children to be in the schools where they have that's no teachers. That's right. Lots of reasons why. Clinics have no doctors because the schools have no teachers. Have no that's correct. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, yeah, so all of these things should be things thought of jointly. In Indonesia, there's one province all the way to the left, which which is not which is actually that gray gray space. It was literally zero. There was a waiting list to, to get to assigned to this particular province of uh, Indonesia. Anybody have any idea what that might be? Bali, <laughs> which is every bit as nice as everyone has ever said. And in fact, there's a waiting list for the doctors to be assigned to. <laughs> <laughs> to, to Bali, the, 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 the ones that are about 5% are all inner Indonesia, Java, low, you know, close in areas, uh, of reasonably good places. I thought that this would be organized by income per capita, but that doesn't, but uh, we, all I had was gross state product, uh, which includes forestry and minerals and stuff like that. The really poor districts are the ones in gray. But the ones that have the hardest time are um, a different sort of, of uh, uh, province. The one way, way, way to the right, which has 60% vacancy rate, um, is um, what used to be called Irian Jaya. It's now West Papua on the island of Papua New Guinea. New Guinea, which uh, most of the doctors who were born and raised on Java think of as the end of the earth. I've actually been to the other side of the island in Papua New Guinea, and they're basically right. It's very close to the, uh, close to the end of the it's, it's thousands of miles away from, uh, um, from Jakarta, and they have a really hard time uh, uh, staffing uh, their facilities. Okay, what do people find when they get to PhDs? They got your vac vacancies, but you also, even for the ones that have vacancies met, you also see absent workers. Um, this is something I think should be studied, should be measured on a regular basis. Uh, the study that I'm familiar with is the one I was part of, um, but that's already 13 years old. Uh, so I have no idea whether NRHM has changed uh, absentee um, uh, workers. I think not. I was working in Karnataka both before and after, and there's been no particular change um, there. Uh, but in any case, we're, the, we're, we saw an average of for, for India of about 42% of healthcare workers uh, absent at any particular time based on uh, surprise visits to, uh, to the facilities. This, time, this is also organized, and then we did it in a couple other countries. Um, this is organized from left to right also in terms of income per capita. I don't see anything for healthcare particularly, uh, except possibly, no, I don't see anything for healthcare. But I do see it for teachers a little bit. 
And I think this is, let me just throw this out there, um, a possibility that one of the things that uh, le that affects absenteeism among public employees is the accountability to the uh, to the neighborhood and to the no, place that we're talking about, and richer family, richer teacher, richer sorry, richer parents can impose more accountability, more monitoring, more care on the teachers than on health workers. Um, health, health is an episodic kind of thing. Teaching is everybody asks their children, what did you do in school today? And if they say, well, nothing, because the teacher didn't show up, uh, richer um, uh, parents are likely to try to do something uh, about that. I'm making all that up. I think they're interesting hypotheses. I also think there's something um, to it. In any case, when you go to a public facility in India, there's a 40% chance that the person, that the provider that you thought was going to be there isn't. Breaking that down, uh, let me just look at doctors. Uh, this is, again, states left to right. Um, I think it vaguely goes down, but I wouldn't stake my life on it. Uh, this actually breaks up the absence rate uh, of doctors uh, by claimed reason. Uh, so sometimes we would show up at the facility and it would, uh, and the only person there would be like the chokidar. And uh, so it's really difficult to interview the doctors who weren't there as to why they weren't there. So we were limited to whatever was available. Uh, so we would ask the chokidar, so why isn't Dr. Saab here? And uh, they would say, oh, uh, official duty, or he's on leave. If the facility was closed, that was a, uh, that was a sort of a telltale one. But, um, um, but if you look at the numbers, Let's say take leave in Tamil Nadu. That's twenty. That's uh, twenty percentage points of meaning uh, is a, is accountable to going on leave. Now, in fact, there is some liberal leave policies for for doctors, much more liberal than most civil servants. But it's not one day a week. Twenty percent. What? Um, and so, while that's what they, what's that's, that's what was, we were told, it can't possibly be true, because they, they, those levels can't really be that high. Is there a study on why again you see such variation? I mean, are states doing things differently, and do we know what they're doing? No. As far as I know, this is the only nationwide study uh, that's been done, um, and that was not necessarily tied to the uh, interventions of the state. I would love if this was measured regularly, and then we could see that when the state starts manipulating um, policies one way or the other, do we see a change? But we don't see a change. We only have this one, one observation. <laughs> okay, third one. Uh, let me just sort of get... Well, yeah, I was the other personnel. Actually, there might be a, one thing that was surprising, since I'm going to about to go to the next topic, which uh, requires some explanation of methodology, maybe I'll stick to this one for a little bit. Um, one thing that was surprising on this one is the Town Lab um, line is really high. See, it's the one, what, fifth from the right, and it has a really high uh, um, level of absenteeism. And I think that might have been a real fluke. At the time that we did the study, um, the state government was changing <laughs> its, um, uh, its, its policy and was putting more CHC, no, more PHCs that would be re replacing subcenters. Uh, and so a lot of the, uh, they were in the middle of transition. Uh, and so a lot of what we called um, PHCs, because that's what they call PHCs, were actually former subcenters, recently former uh, subcenters, and this could have been um, uh, uh, a result of, of this disorder. Um, of course, uh, health is a state subject, so um, different states will in fact do that um, differently. Uh, it's actually kind of hard for me to tell by looking at GIS. Uh, it, sometimes it's between villages if they want to cover two villages, which is odd in some way because it's not close to anybody in particular. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes it's right in the middle of, um, 
of, uh, of, of settlements, it, it varies quite a lot. And I, I have not studied this. And for that matter, I'm not sure whether anybody is particularly. Sounds like a great source of exogenous radiation. Could be. Uh, especially if you are worried about absenteeism, say, being in the middle of nowhere. And therefore, absenteeism is high. Then, if you're placing the PHCs closer to slightly urban locations or dense villages, you might have an impact on absenteeism. Uh, you might very well, but look at the trade off that, you're, that we're dealing with here. As you're saying, put the primary health care centers in places that people, that college educated people want to go, you're going to be putting them into quite appealing places that probably have high income. In which case, we're, to, to what extent are we using this as a way of helping the poor? It's in fact in the most remote, remote areas, difficult areas, that the poorest people are found. The, it might be a good way to make sure that your own facilities are used more. But, but it doesn't have to be an extreme, right? I mean, even uh, in locations where it's not necessarily very open and very dense, but you know, within the sort of uh, network of villages, there might be one best village, and they could all be connected. Yes, that's that's very possible. This is a um, a deep problem of management of the of the systems. I don't think we know anywhere near enough. So assume you assume there's no implementation problem. You assume there is no absenteeism. It's not as if the policy was made thinking, oh, there is absenteeism, and where can I get people? So that if that's not a consideration, then you just place them wherever you. All of these issues could raise a few other questions of public policy is do you really want uh, let me propose a substitute policy which is building better roads that are that are more uh, regularly traveled with transportation instead of making the doctor go to the patient perhaps we can make it much easier for the patients to go to the doctors which also would also make it easier for the students to go to primary schools and for the uh, farmers to go to um, uh, extension service offices and I mean, there's lots of reasons for doing roads uh, maybe maybe transportation is a direct substitute for uh, building more um, facilities this is something we might like to, um, to to look at and if they are really sick and since lots of people bypass the primary health centers to go directly to a hospital, we might like not really want to encourage that, but at least it gets them a chance to go directly to the, to the hospital. So I think uh, we sometimes should think broader as to what's the full scope of public policy to improve people's health. It could be building these buildings in rural areas. It could be building roads to have better kind of, kind of connectivity um, generally. I think we should keep an open mind on that. It's uh, fine. We have a good friend who is a member of parliament from Orissa, who says exactly this. He says that there is something called the Pradhan Mantri Kran Sadak Yojana, a rural roads building program. He says that was transformative in Orissa for all the reasons you described. That they were able to implement initiatives to get uh, poor people to a plausible healthcare facility, as opposed to the impossible challenge of trying to get a plausible healthcare facility to poor people. And the innumerable other impacts on income, which is itself a pretty powerful thing. Good. All right.